generative AI is probably going to lead to the biggest change in what someone's job is going to consist of, as well as what job categories are going to grow and what job categories are going to shrink. It's going to be the biggest change we've ever seen. And these are business driven decisions, but they have huge implications on people. CHROs need to be partners with the other members of the leadership team to be able to say, how is this going to affect how we think about staffing and jobs, compensation and all sorts of things in every function, in the product function, the engineering function, in the sales function, in the research and development function, whatever the function is, it's going to change. And so a CHRO needs to partner with the business to understand what that's like. Parker, welcome to the show. How are you? Chris, it's a delight to be here. It's crazy. We spoke a couple of weeks ago on Zoom and now you're here in London. <laughs> Life works out that way. It's kind of weird because like, I'll ever speak to uh, leaders like yourself and I'll meet them like 10 years later or the week after. <laughs> so it's, it's crazy because like episode one of the podcast, it was uh, L'Oreal CHRO Stefan Chabonnier. And it, we only met last year after like 10 years um, as well. And we're like, how have we known each other for 10 years and we're only meeting now face to face? Um, as well, but it's so much nicer to see everyone face to face. This is the, the virtual world that we're in. We get to know each other's yeah. screen presences, and then it's so <laughs> nice to connect in person. Yeah. Before we jump in, tell everyone a little bit more about you personally and your journey to where we are now with Valence. We'll give a couple of quick highlights. So I studied engineering and then became a consultant, but I was very quickly attracted to the org practice. And so the question was, how do we make big companies, better places to work? How do we make them both more efficient, but also places where people can connect more? Mm -hmm. And so I did that for a couple of years, but at the same time, I was trying to found a nonprofit. Um, now that nonprofit was called Engineers Without Borders, and that ended up just taking off. So I spent 10 years co-leading that and quickly realized that most of my job was actually around people. And how do you connect people together? How do you help them form really cohesive teams that are going to be doing difficult work in some difficult circumstances? Um, they have to be open to feedback. They have to be able to sort of take their ego and put it aside. So we were teaching engineers. Now there's some stereotypes about engineers. We were teaching them about the Johari window, about the ladder uh -huh. of inference, about the four dimensions of trust, about amygdala hijacks and how to uh, address and avoid those. So we're trying to get them to sort of go deep within themselves to become better members of a team and better leaders. Mm -hmm. So I did that for 10 years. Um, and then I had a, a bit of a, a zigzag in my career and I was uh, recruited by Bridgewater Associates, okay. world's largest hedge fund, yeah. also probably one of the strangest places to work. Um, and I worked directly with the co-CEO there. So I was uh, working with the founder, Ray, the co-CEO. Wow. And part of what- I follow Ray's work a lot. It's, and his I mean, book it's and everything. Uh, every video that comes out on Ray, I'm like, I'm watching it. <laughs> it's fascinating work. And and I think that, you know, the culture that they developed is, I would say it's sort of almost like an Olympic type culture, which is like, if you have that level of intensity, it works really well. I am personally not convinced it scales to more regular workforces and not everyone can work in that environment and not That's everyone for a specific yeah many many people don't part of my role there was to look at how do you systematize management how do you identify the kinds of people that will succeed there how do you help them go through the onboarding process um and one of the things i took away was bridgewater was way ahead of its time with regards to digital tools so i sort of looked at that and said i think we're going to a place in the future where people will be more willing and able to use digital tools. Now, Bridgewater was all about understanding individuals. And what I thought really mattered was how do people work together? What's the connections or the bonds between them? Mm -hmm. And so when we founded Valence, it's actually a chemistry term. It means the combining power of atoms to form more complex molecules. Hence the logo. Hence the logo. <laughs> and hence the, you know, the focus on how people work together on building more successful teams. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit of the journey to founding wow. Valence. Oh, first and foremost, I realized that I've been pronouncing it wrong the entire time. So it's valence, not it's, balance. I'd say 50, <laughs> it's 50, 50. People so pronounce that it all I've, sorts I've been, of different The entire ways. time we've been talking, I've been saying your company name wrong. <laughs> that, that is okay. I'd say half of our customers pronounce it balance. <laughs> okay. No, but I want to go back for a second. What was the inspiration behind the nonprofit? 
So the idea was, this was sort of the early 2000s, and Doctors Without Borders was doing an incredible job okay. mobilizing the medical profession to try to help contribute to ending world poverty. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't the same type of uh, movement or the same type of organization for engineers. And so my co-founder and I thought that this was a, a moment and opportunity to bring the engineering profession into this, uh, you know, work to try to eradicate uh, or help eradicate, make a, a small dent in reducing global poverty. Yeah. No, I love that. And what was the step from Bridgewater to Valence? So as I mentioned, Bridgewater was all about what is an individual like and try to understand the characteristics of an individual, but they were really treated as individual Lego pieces. That was one of the terms that was used around Bridgewater. And what I believed was that how people work together, their ability to build trust, to communicate, to understand how to hand projects off to each other, that those connections were at least as important as what an individual was like. Mm -hmm. And so when we started Valence, we had this idea that you know, myself, many other people, probably many of the folks that are listening to this podcast, if they're senior, they would have had the experience of uh, an incredible executive coach or leadership coach or team facilitator. And when you've experienced that kind of bespoke support, you realize that that's really what yeah. leads to transformative learning and transformative change. And the problem is it's just too expensive. It's not, it's not scalable. It's too not expensive. In that model anyway. Exactly. Yeah. And so could we build digital tools that tried to recreate some of that bespoke support using, at the time, it was data science, using data science to be able to personalize the experience for an individual leader, an individual team, um, and then be able to offer that at scale. And we very quickly began working with the Fortune 500. So the scale was 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people quite quickly. Wow. And of course, you must have been overjoyed when generative AI came along. Well, <laughs> to, to I like. mean, it's fascinating because, you know, if you go back to our, our you know, our some of our founding documents and, and sort of vision, yeah. we talked about this idea of sort of a coach in everyone's pocket. Really? But it felt like science yeah. fiction. It really <laughs> did. And people talked about AI and HR. And I always just dismissed it because AI back then was machine learning. Machine learning was all about, you have to have labeled data and it just doesn't capture the complexity of what management is like, of what leadership is like. Yeah. I had some friends, I'd studied cognitive psychology, cognitive science in my undergrad. So I'd been paying attention to linguistics and some of the evolution. And folks might know that Canada was a bit of a, a sort of the, the training ground, the, the foundation of large language models came out of some of the universities in Canada. I did not know that. So Jeffrey Hinton was at University of oh, okay. Toronto. <laughs> um, so the, uh, we had some, you know, one of the, one wow. of the other fathers of, of AI was at the Université de Montréal. So there was always a bit of a buzz around that and paying attention to it. And I had some friends who were, you know, in the sector. And one of the things they said to me is, Parker, you know how you've always said management is about language and AI so far is about numbers? And I said, yes. And they said, well, I think we're going to crack wow, language. language. And so we realized early on, if large language models were going to crack language and reasoning and understanding and comprehension, that that was the place to make the investments. Um, the power of personalization yeah. affordably at scale is it's just utterly transformative. Yeah. And th that was similar for me with Atlas Copilot. Like we tried doing this five years ago. It, in, in the beginning, it was just for the podcast. I just was like, hey, we've got thousands of hours of this show. Can I use AI to give people instant answers to their questions, take them to the exact second in the podcast, right? Or summarizing podcasts or saying, oh, you know, of the thousand CHRO interviews Chris has done, what are the key, you know, characteristics of a successful CHRO? I, I just wanted the ability to be able to distill, but it would, we were just too early on the journey. Absolutely. We tried and we failed miserably and spent a lot of money <laughs> doing so along the way, but the vision was always there, just the technology. And then soon, and then as soon as OpenAI launched, I was like, oh, we were just a bit early. On, on this journey. And the yeah. thing that I've experienced is the most successful companies are those that were early on the journey mm. because you had to have tried, you had to have thought about it, you had to have struggled with it, you had to have tried to <laughs> yeah. get your data into the right form. Yeah. And if you just started building in the past six months or 12 months, 
you actually don't get the head start no. that a company like you. People are jumping on it now because it's cool and it's the thing. <laughs> oh, it's like yeah. But let, let's jump into it. You know, first and foremost, why should um, AI be the number one priority for CHROs right now? So I feel very fortunate these days because we have been thinking about generative AI now for two and a half years, and CHROs. I probably have talked to literally 40 or 50 in the past six months through a range of different, you know, either conversations as they're exploring buying valence or gatherings. And there's probably, I think, two main reasons. So number one, generative AI is probably going to lead to the biggest change in what someone's job is going to consist of, as well as what job categories are going to grow and what job categories are going to shrink. Um, it's going to be the biggest change we've ever seen. And these are business driven decisions, but they have huge implications on people. And so number one, CHROs need to be partners with the other members of the, you know, the leadership team to be able to say, how is this going to affect how we think about staffing and jobs and compensation and all sorts of things in every function, in the product function, the engineering function, in the sales function, in the research and development function, whatever the function is it's going to change. And so a CHRO needs to partner with the business to understand what that's like. So that's number one. And then number two, I think it's going to utterly change the HR function. And so we've been basically forced to compromise. No one thinks that, you know, an online learning session, no matter how well we try to design it, is the solution yeah. that managers are asking for. A one-off online session for a few hours, good luck. Exactly, people say, well, we're gonna put nuggets, we're gonna put it in the flow of work. I've, I've never heard a manager say, my problem is that I don't have enough learning content to consume, and if I just had more videos to watch, yeah. I would be a better manager never heard that. And so we have a chance now, or CHROs, heads of talent, heads of learning, they have a chance to reinvent what the learning function is to be closer to what managers have always asked for and needed. And so I think that, you know, the business impact on how work is done, as well as the impact on the, the talent function in particular, they're going to be game changing. Yeah. What, during those conversations, what's been the, the, the response? <laughs> I think From the, CHROs, the CHROs that we talk to feel a natural tension, which is one, a belief that this is going to be a, just a wave that is going to sweep through the workforce and they need to pay attention to it. And then also sort of a, 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 both a caution and a sort of question of like, how do I demystify what is possible? How should I begin to explore it? Um, you don't want to place a bet on something that's going to end up being you know, the wrong path. But you also don't want to stand back and not invest and in miss, anything yeah, miss the opportunity. and miss the opportunity. And so that tension of sort of where do I make my investments? Um, who are the partners that I work with? How do I understand what's possible in the technology? That's the question they're wrestling with. And I had a, a fascinating conversation with a, a CHRO from sort of a tech oriented CHRO from a tech company in, in California. And his his summary was, if I could make a clone of myself and that clone, all they did was try to stay on top of the technology, I don't think I would still have enough time to be able to truly understand. Yeah. So that question of how do I find the time to personally invest in and learn about it, I think that's one of the, the top questions. It's almost impossible, isn't it? Because the, the pace of change, innovation, and there's like thousands of companies reaching out to them. You know, every company in the world now has an AI solution. Every HR vendor now has an AI solution. So they're just, you know, when I speak to Citrus every day, they're just inundated. They're overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. And, and, and everyone's claiming to, you know, solve their, their problem. And they're like, and, and a big part of it is, you know, where do they start? And I'd love to understand what you're hearing from them. What are some of the use cases that you've seen CHRO say, this is where I'm going to start with AI? So in the conversations, there's probably two broad categories of okay. use cases. And there are AI solutions that will automate back office processes. They're basically automating processes that people... Um, employees, leaders, managers, they need to do, but they're not 
sort of true value add for the you know the individuals in the company. So you need to check your um, you know your status of how many uh, PTO days you have. It's like an AI self serve. AI self serve, and yeah. so if you can just take that off of and, and right now HRBPs and a range of other people are answering those questions, and if you can automate that process, which has often a unique personalization nature to it. Um, that is going to be net good, and that automation is a you know is a helpful function. But no manager is going to say at the end of the year, "Oh wow, like I was able to get my answers, my questions answered slightly faster." And so I think the second thing that they're looking at is what are tools or use cases that I can put in the hands of managers that might help them. And so you know we obviously have a a, a bit of a lens that's focused on our AI coach, but we have honestly had a lot of, of CHROs and heads of talent say, this is a really interesting use case because it's purely net positive for managers. We're not trying to extract information from them. We're not trying to automate away their jobs. We're not trying to do anything like that. We're genuinely giving them a chance to learn in a different and better way. And we're going to run a pilot, get their feedback and see what they have to say. Yeah. What are the most common uh, questions that you see that managers are asking, asking the uh... Uh, could you say AI assistant or do you say AI copilot? What, what, yeah. lang I, what language do you use? So we've, I mean, That's another one. We've, that could, could <laughs> we've given a name to our, our okay, AI great. What's coach. The name? So the name is Nadia. Nadia, great. And it's quite funny because people feel attached to the name. We actually tried to change the name last year. You are like, no, no, don't do it, and Nadia. And literally <laughs> there was just an uproar and people said, I want Nadia back. What That's happened hilarious. to my Nadia? That's great. So connected to it, right? People, when it's got a name. There yeah. there is an element and I think one of our one of our customers said it best on one of our, our recent webinars, and this was the, the chief talent officer of Experian, and she said, I think one of the things that we forget is management, especially for new managers, and especially today, management is hard and management is lonely. Mm -hmm. And it's not true that you can just go to your manager for help because your manager is busy and your manager promoted you thinking that you have the ability to do that. And most of what you're trying to do is show that you can actually do this new job. And so you need a, almost like a, a, a first start where you can just, without any fear of judgment, any fear of, of, of anything, you can just bring your problem and work through it. So when we first built Nadia, we thought it was about so the more traditional sort of learning and training and development people would want to build skills and that's not that's not the case at all managers want instant help on whatever problem is on their mind they they want to save time they have something they have to work on this week and if an ai coach can support them on that then they will keep returning to it so we built the ai coach nadia to start with any problem that Give a manager example of what common ones that will come up so someone might say um you know, I've got a challenge with a peer of mine. We've got a, a project report coming up and, you know, this peer tends to take credit and I want to make sure that, you know, we can present equally. So this is, again, this is the kind of thing it's like in Every the relationships day, yeah. of like the peer based relationships of like, there's a little bit of jockeying going on. You know, people <laughs> are, they're both trying to do a good job and they're positioning themselves and how they do a good yeah. job. And so you need a you know, a th a, almost a That's thought a good partner. example of one you wouldn't really go to your manager to, right? Exactly. Like, so you're just, it's so unique to the situation. It, exactly. Yeah. And it's about the, you know, the personal relationship that you have with that peer and how you can make it better. So that's a, that's a common one. People often talk about the questions they have about their team. If they're a newly promoted manager, they might ask about, you know, how do I establish authority? Um, you know, they might say, well, I've, I've read that I should be vulnerable, but I actually How do I do feel that? like I've got imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah. So it's hard to be vulnerable when you have right. imposter syndrome. So there's a lot of that, the sort of emotional energy um, of being a manager. How are you presenting the, um, uh, the feedback? Is it just text? Is it some audio video as well? So we've been using um, voice, voice sorry, since yeah, yeah. the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So managers will speak to Nadia and they can either choose to hear her respond or they can read text. She'll, she'll produce both That's outputs. Cool. And I'd say about, depending on the environment you're in, you might just want the text reply. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So if you're, I, people actually can read faster than they can process words. So I'd say about 
probably 70 or 80 percent of people use voice no, so, input. So again, so it's easier to process reading than it is hearing someone. So yeah, if, if you voice. you can skim an answer and sort of go, oh, here's the two key Quicker points. Quicker than listening to it. Yeah, and okay. you can pause and go, oh, there's two points that Nadia is saying. Okay, let me reflect. Okay, Interesting. whereas voice, you, you go at the pace of the, the speaking oh, voice. Oh, of course, yeah. I never thought about that. And, and, and I'm assuming it's can multiple languages hundred plus languages it's available on your phone it's available on your desktop mm -hmm. microsoft teams integration it can text you email you so yeah. it's very much the the difference between a lot of people ask the difference between chat gpt or okay, internal gpts <laughs> yeah and we talk about purpose-built software and so if you have excel you could do your taxes with excel or with google sheets but you probably rather actually have in the US we use TurboTax. I don't know what or, the or zero in the UK. Uh, yeah. So you want a purpose built piece of software. And really it's just macros That's a on great, top. I'm gonna of steal a that analogy next time someone asks me that question, because I get that a lot with Atlas Code Partner. Yeah. Or oh, why don't I just use that? Because we well, we purposely built it. It purposely point. built. Yeah. And so there's a you understand that expert knowledge that you want to bring in, mm. but also where someone's coming from. A lot of questions have inference behind them and you understand what that inference is. Yeah. So purpose-built software that is also proactive and not just reactive. So Nadia will try to understand what are the challenges you face this week? How can I give you tips and guidance? If you have a meeting coming up on Wednesday at 3 p.m. That's that you've asked for coaching for, she'll send you a couple of talking points. Well, it says predictives. It would like send you some stuff, no, because it's connected to your calendar. It knows his meeting's coming it, up. Hey, you know, here's some advice. Absolutely. Cool. That's cool. Absolutely. That, that's, that's, I think that's the, that's where it's super interesting and you get the, it just becomes part of their flow of work in the exactly. day. I love like, and also as managers, we're so busy sometimes to get like nudges and reminders and stuff like that. It's just so helpful. <laughs> it's just two or three little bullet points or just a little, you know, message on Microsoft Teams and you go, oh yeah, that's the thing that we talked about that I wanted to do. Yeah. Can, does it, can it access the, the, the transcripts from calls? So one of the interesting things is just watching the range of use cases yeah. that emerge as it's out in the wild. And so people are seeking to upload pieces of information. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So we started with a, a very straightforward version. And one of the things that companies ask for that we very quickly built is, can Nadia access my values, my company values, my leadership frameworks, um, my cultural expectations, et cetera. So we have a, a easy way of integrating that. So if you're working- Is that at, just in the prompt? So you just prompt that or how do you integrate that? I mean, we have a huge, we think that the, the challenge that managers face, that coaching faces is how do you draw on an increasingly large context to be able to give the right coaching? And okay. so if I have, if I'm a coach and I have a hundred conversations with you, there's a lot to draw on. And if I know my company's values can draw on that. If I know more about your job, what is it like to be a, you know, a salesperson? I don't know in the, you know, we work with steel plants, you know, if you're, if you're a manufacturer in steel plants, what's unique about your job? Or if you're a salesperson in, you know, consumer packaged goods, what's unique about your job? So there's, there's almost an infinite amount of context and you can't just dump that. That's another thing that's different, right? When you talk about the difference between what you're doing and, and, uh, and chat GPT, it doesn't have any context. It doesn't have any context. That's sort of such an important thing. So the fact that, you know, it knows the person's job title, what it means to do that job. It knows the company's values, the culture uses all of that all of that and to be able to pull the right in general a context window you probably can't have more than four or five potential things for the the prompt to draw on otherwise it, yeah, yeah otherwise it just gets confused <laughs> and you could run the same thing yeah. 10 times we've done it 10 different answers <laughs> yeah and so what we've done we have uh, in our head of ai is a, a turing fellow here in the uk actually he's co-authored or authored a hundred plus papers on it. And his expertise is how do you draw on this context to be able to make smarter conversational assistance? So that's the, I think that's the key because a manager wants the, the personal guidance that feels right to them. And the more you can do that, the more people are going to get value, the more they're going to use it, the more context you get. So you get this positive flywheel. Mm -hmm. What are some of the um, other ways you see AI being experimenting with, experimenting with in the workplace? So I think there's, um, sector specific use cases. Okay. So obviously there's a lot of folks out there experimenting with Copilot for, um, 
for GitHub. And so I think that's a that's a particularly useful um, opportunity. Explain what that is, Revo, because not everyone's gonna know what GitHub is. So in, in HR, for, maybe I'm for people sure. who are you know who are, <laughs> are programming, who are yeah. you know who are coding, um, the copilot for GitHub allows you to be able to complete basically tasks that might be, you know, might take five or 10 or 20 minutes almost instantly because Copilot's saying, I think I know what you're doing. I think I can anticipate this. So it won't write an entire program for you, but it understands what the task is that you have. And then take an action. Yeah. yeah. And it will like complete it for you. And that, you know, the power of coding in AI for coding is, is actually, it's extraordinary and it's going to get better and better. Mm. Do you think do you think we'll get to the point where people don't need to know how to code and they could just write a prompt? I mean, I think we're, I think it is probably similar to, you know, the advent of the calculator. So you can, Fair. okay, you know, you don't have to know how to multiply two numbers in your head. And I mean, if you look back at the 1960s and 70s, there were roomfuls of people whose job it was to do manual calculations and that was replaced with the calculator and with the computer but you still needed people to think about what are we trying to do mm. what's the effective way to do it so i think we'll be able to get to a place i mean i am not a coder and i tried a saturday one saturday morning me I too but i've used it i've tried it can i just like write something and be able to like have a website up and running and i chose a relatively simple you know simple solution and the 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 gen ai um i think i used claude which is part of the anthropic family and it's mm -hmm. got some really neat innovations if you haven't tried claude you should yeah. check it out um and i had a i had a website up and running it's interactive crazy. website in probably about 45 minutes it's nuts I, I use one i think it's called web 10 and it's a, a specifically for websites you go on the website you write your problem on a website about this this and this and it just builds it straight away and it even generates the images for the website the copy for the website, everything. Even um, it is even a section I clicked on. It's like here's all of your like um, social media promotion campaigns, just automatically generated those. That would have took me months in the past. What I could do in like what I did in like an hour. I mean, it's fascinating. I think it's, you and I are doing the thing that a lot of experts recommend, which is just experiment with yeah. it. And it doesn't have to be for, you don't have to, you're not going to find the winning use case in your first experiment, <laughs> but the more you understand what's possible, 100%. the more you have a couple of these magical moments. I mean, our eyes are lighting up at what's possible. Um, the more you as a CHRO or a head of talent, the more you personally experience it, the more conviction you bring to your teams. Yeah. I think, and I, I encourage that with the team constantly as well. Like we just, um, we typically take maybe like three, four hours to edit a podcast. And one of my editors came to me with a plugin that edited the podcast in two minutes. So it knows who's speaking, it switches the camera back and forth, zoom in, zooms out, literally. And, and you can see the timeline just editing in real time, two minutes for an hour episode. And I was just like, do I continue paying you the same amount of money? Because <laughs> that's one of the interesting things that right now, right? Is the, the way in which what gets done is also going to change. So if someone, is, uh, that something that typically took them the entire day, someone's figured out how to do that exactly in half an hour, should we, should we still be paying them the same amount for doing that? And is I think that, one of the things that I've heard is happening at companies is because there's a lot of, um, you know, there could be some restrictions or some hesitations about use cases. You still have enterprising employees who are trying to figure it out on their own. Yeah, And if you're, you know, this editor, or if you're an employee that's found a way to do a day's work of work in an hour, yeah. do you have an incentive to share that? That's such a good point. Because I don't think I would in, in, my, in my previous company, unfortunately, because of the way the culture was, uh, I, uh, I I have an example, but it's not AI. AI. So when um, LinkedIn first came out, I worked in a company for 10 years, outbound sales calls, you know, three, four hours of calls a day, 150 dials a day, super strict KPIs, right? Like like a Wolf of Wall Street type sales floor, like, you know, super high intense sales. And uh, what I did is uh, I found a, um, like a, a, a Google Chrome plugin that was connected to LinkedIn that allowed me to message people on LinkedIn and set up calls. So all of a sudden I was only having conversations 
And my, and my manager at the time was like, all, actually the whole team was like, how are you only having calls? Like, what are you doing? And I was like, <laughs> I didn't want to tell anyone. So you, so, uh, and they're like, it doesn't make sense. It's like, you have like, f now you, you, were, you were doing three hours on the phone. Now you're doing an hour, right? And getting four or five times the results because I had a very tailored search specific, yeah. right? And I even, and then I used the money, extra money I was making and I bought my own marketing platform and then I bought leads. I bought 50,000 HR contacts and I had another campaign running here and my LinkedIn automation <laughs> up here and I was still calling so, as well. And I think I did that for like two, three years. And I was like, you know, the average deals were like maybe like 20 a month. I was doing like 80 and people just had no idea why. And it was because the company didn't, there wasn't, it, in the past when I had approached my leadership with those type of ideas, I was just shut down. Immediately just and I shut, think this is shut down. such a great example of what CHROs need to be doing. They need to role model it. They need their organizations yeah. to be role modeling. They need to make sure the whole company is doing that. And so to be able to celebrate yeah. people who are finding efficiencies, to be able to reward them, promote them. And you were on the front lines. Your manager probably wouldn't have figured out how to you know, get that plug in or what those options yeah. were because he or she isn't doing that day to day. And so your innovation might happen from your frontline employees and you need to make sure you know that, is. Yeah. that's where it's going to happen. And yeah. you need to make sure there's clear flows of information and just repeat over and over again that it's good to do these experiments as, you know, as much as possible within the constraints of, I'm, I know it's that, hard. Yeah. That, that legal and, and IT and security, Yeah, but figure out a way to thread that needle because if you tamp down the innovation, it's going to happen anyway. It's just not going to produce the benefits that you want as a company. Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, what I want to talk specifically about a talent function. How, how will AI impact the talent function? Well, I think to me, the her, one of the purposes of the talent function has been to say, how do we develop our people? I mean, that's probably, there's sort of two broad things, which is like, how do we bring in the right talent and how do we develop it? And honestly, bringing in the right talent, everyone knows it's, it's hard to be, have a competitive advantage in that. It's just difficult. And so if you can be disproportionately good at developing your own internal talent, I think of, you know, Barcelona's, um, you know, academy for yeah. their, their, their football team, you know, they were famous for picking and identifying and building the right talent. And if you can do that, you can, you know, create a sustainable winner. And so we've always been limited by, if you ask talent teams and L and D teams, how, you know, they're doing learning. And if you ask a, an employee or leader, how they learn, you're unfortunately going to get two different answers. There's a lot of, you know, people just, you know, if they're lucky, they had a good mentor, maybe they have a peer, maybe they have a friend, maybe they're reading books or podcasts, listening to podcasts on the weekend. They're struggling to be better and they do turn a little bit to their talent team, but they honestly try to figure it out a lot themselves. Yeah. And so that ability to say, okay, how do we support each person individually in the place where they are and genuinely help them to build the skills using AI in a way that personalizes it for them? To me, that is a, it's just a fundamental rethink. And so the encouragement we give to the talent teams is don't look at your existing processes and try to understand how to make each of those connected sort of building blocks better because you actually have a chance to start over, start from first principles. Yeah. And we haven't had that opportunity sort of ever in our, you know, in our career. So it, it should be really exciting. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that um, I think you'll meet in my co-founder Guillermo Miranda next week. And uh, with Guillermo's background as a chief learning officer at IBM Boeing, when we started Atlas Copilot, that was one of the main things you were speaking about. Let's use this as an opportunity to completely reimagine each this because it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Exactly. Um, and it took a, it takes a little bit more time, obviously, when you're trying to create something that's not that's never been done, you know, um, as well. But that's exciting as well at the same time to be, on, to be on that journey. The thing we encourage, you know, when I'm talking to the CHROs or chief talent officers is have a portfolio of of experiments. Yeah. So experiment with like a simple change, experiment with something, okay, maybe, you know, one of our existing vendors has an AI version of X, experiment with that's like, but also experiment with the bigger bets, the bet that could be truly transformative. And the only way you find out what works these days is by truly 
putting a solution in manager's hands and by seeing what kind of partner you have. Is this a partner who understands AI, is going to be sort of making sure that they're on top of you know, the latest trends on all the different architectures that exist out there, et cetera. Um, if you have a solution your managers like and a good partner that's sort of growing with the technology, that actually has the, a transformative potential that potentially just doing, you know, smaller, safer experiments yeah. might not expose you to. You, know, you kind of got to do a combination of both. Exactly. Right. It's portfolio of experiments. That's yeah. the. Yeah. I think, uh, but you also have to have the right culture and uh, set to be able to do that. Right. Because if you, you need to have a culture of, I love Novartis, they always talk about the culture of curiosity. Right. Even to the point where they, every year they celebrate the biggest failures of the year which I think is always hilarious it's not framed that way but you know so, so you but because if you don't have that people aren't going to take those risks I agree and I don't think you can use we don't have this culture as a an excuse mm -hmm. so I think at the top you need to say this is the mentality of experimentation the 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 lens of experimentation that we need to have and you need to as quickly as possible, bring as many people as possible along. Yeah. And some companies, if they've had that for a decade, they might have a bit of an advantage, but that's your, your challenge as a, you know, as a leader is to bring that as quickly as possible. Yeah. we talk about a lot of UK use cases. Um, what advice would you give to then enterprises, companies that are looking at a solution like this? Because as we said in the beginning of the episode, one of the biggest problems is they're overwhelmed with a million companies approaching them about various AI solutions, what advice would you give them? Like one, like where do they start? But also if they're speaking to like, for example, an AI vendor or a solution that has AI, like what type of questions should they be asking? I think probably by now, one of the big sources of information for them should be their peers. And so network with your fellow chief talent officers, network with your fellow CHROs, your heads of leadership, and ask them, talk about that portfolio of solutions. You know, what are the, you know, the, the changes we're making to our back office? Like, what are the vendors that you're using there? What are the, you know, the bigger bets? What are the truly transformative bets? Mm -hmm. And what are the partner, who are the partners that you've enjoyed working with? So I think that that is probably the safest way to cut through the noise. Um, if you're talking to an existing vendor, what we've experienced is everyone hand waves the same about AI. And so it's okay. really hard to demystify that. Yeah. But really try to dig into what their AI strategy is. You know, is it truly transformative or is it just adding on to their existing way of doing things? Because I think AI will put some of the existing um, sort of tracks, learning tracks, almost out of business. Um, and so I think they need to develop a, an independent point of view of, you know, where do we think AI is going to be truly transformative? Yeah. And then I think the, the third thing is, you know, how easy is this to actually do a trial? So if it's easy to put in managers' hands, if it's easy to sort of differentiate in the experience and understand that, I think that's the, you know, the, the quickest way. And then obviously, you know, who are the use cases? We've, we've got an incredible AI summit coming up and the whole purpose is to demystify some of the challenges. So we have, I, I had to write a list down because we've got so many, but we've got the CHROs of WPP, Hearst, Prudential, the former CHRO of IBM, and then either global head of talent or global head of leadership of Experian, Delta, Novartis, Schneider Electric, Analog Devices, City, and Thomson Reuters. Amazing. So this is quite a collection of like top leaders and they're gonna be sharing literally what are the solutions that they're exploring? Who are the partners that they're finding most helpful? What are the internal use cases that are, you know, being pulled where the, the demand is being pulled from them? All these kinds of questions. So it's happening in New York in, in a little over, in about five weeks. There's mm -hmm. a virtual option as well, but attending those kinds of events, talking to their peers yeah. in those kinds of forums, so crucial. No, we, we, well, when's the date? <laughs> November 14th. Amazing. Well, if you're, wherever you're listening or watching right now, there'll be a link in the chat to sign up. Uh, there's a virtual option as well? Virtual option as well. Amazing. Uh, I'll link that in the chat. And we, we're doing something similar in, in December. We have our AI HR Summit. Exactly. Same thing. And it, it, you use the exact word to help demystify. Yeah. Right. And I want to go back to your couple of your three points. First and foremost, you. It, it, you'd be amazed how little CHROs I speak to actually reach out to their peers. 
<laughs> so do that. <laughs> Reach out to your network, ask what they're currently doing, what's working, what's not working. It's such a simple thing to do that can save you a lot of time and headaches <laughs> by, by doing that. And I love the fact that you said there's a difference between companies that are adding HR, I mean, sorry, adding AI, but, but, but compared to companies that are grounded in AI, right, from the very beginning. Very different. Yeah. Right, we we call it AI native, like we, love it. Rather than adding it to our old suite of tools, yeah. we said we're going to build it from scratch. We're going to integrate our tools, but we're going to integrate three sixties. We're going to mm. integrate calendars. We're going to integrate everything. Love it. Starting with AI at its core. Amazing. And um, what was the last part? What was the third one? I've just completely blanked. Just the the that portfolio of experimentation. Yeah, portfolio of experimentation. Um, what, what, what we didn't have to plan this question, but. What are questions with, around AI that we're not asking that we really should be? Um, so I personally think the impact of AI on the workforce is being under discussed. Really? Okay. I, I, I think that the the speed with which, so I think we're probably in, there's, there's a few different chapters. So there's, um, you know, the, the single purpose AI, the sort of chat GPTs, they really, to get them to be effective and efficient and productivity tools, you need to really invest time. And as an individual, you need to solve it yourself. I almost think of this as sort of the, you know, back in the late 1970s, early 1980s, the sort of hacker culture around computers. If you were invested, you could build a solution and you could solve something, but it didn't scale. And so you have individuals who are using it very effectively in your company and you have individuals who aren't using it. But as more products are built, purpose-built products that integrate the AI into a workflow that solve a problem for you, whether it's you know a, a leadership type problem, um, or whether it's sector specific, whether it's sales, or whether it's engineering, or whether it's R and D or something else, you will start to find that you can hit the productivity across your entire workforce. And I think that those purpose-built products, because they are designed for specific, you know, specific groups and specific purposes. They actually will scale and almost instantly. I mean, we could, we could turn on our AI coach Nadia to a hundred thousand people, um, you know, in twenty four hours, and you never really had products that were that efficient yeah, and effective. That always surprises people, and they could hit that scale. Yeah, and so once that happens, I think that people's jobs will change more quickly. The relationship between um, individuals who might feel threatened and the company is going to change. And I think uh, CHROs need to be investing so much up front to build that trust, put tools that are helpful, show positive use cases, because I think there's going to be a lot in the next 24 months that's going to shake things up. Yeah. Now, I think we'll leave it there. <laughs> I think we can, it's, it's, you said 12 months, right? But it, it feels like the pace of innovation, what I thought was going to take us a couple of years has been happening in three to six months. And there's, you know, we've got, you know, we've got Elon Musk launching his new large language model. There's other companies, players coming to the fourth world. Obviously, Copilot launched their, um, what, two weeks ago um, as well. Their new update. It's absolutely fascinating times. Before I let you go, um, where can people connect with you personally if they want to reach out to you directly? And also, where can they learn more about Valence? They can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm very active there. And so we'll be able to drop the link in. Um, Valence is valence.co and we'll put a link in for our AI summit and really encourage Amazing. people to sign up for it. Well, I appreciate you coming. It's nice to see you in person and uh, I'm looking forward to the summit yeah. as well. It's wonderful to connect. You guys are doing great work here. Appreciate you. Bye. Thanks, Chris.